Hello, lovelies. Welcome to year three of Lessons from the Universe with Jennifer Hall. If you're new to the show, please remember, back it up and see what you've been missing. Those of you who love it already, remember, I need you. I need you to like, to share, review, subscribe, and maybe even consider clicking that patron button. Let's grow our community so that we can grow and learn together. Hello, lovelies. Today, I am excited to share with you volume 11 of sort of the podcast within the podcast, a series that I call Metaphysical Storytelling. For those of you who are not familiar with metaphysics, metaphysics is a way of reading the Bible. It reveals the metaphysical meaning behind the stories. It takes apart what was written and looks for the esoteric knowledge hidden within that really helps us understand the awakening process. It is, in my opinion, uh, not intended to dispute any of your personal beliefs about the Bible. Fact, fiction, history, whatever it is, we can set that aside and remove that debate from this conversation because this conversation is how a particular story in the Bible can guide us along our path to awakening, how it is a story of the evolution of our spiritual path in this human existence. The Bible story that has been circling around me for weeks, that has been very much heavy, strong in my consciousness this week, so much so that I could not not make it this week's episode, is actually the book of Revelation. Now, there's a lot of immediate reaction people have around the book of Revelation. It's important to recognize it's not the book of the apocalypse, <laughs> okay? In fact, the word apocalypse isn't even used. And apocalypse in its original meaning actually means revelation. A revelation is an unveiling, disclosure of truth. It is taking that is which, which has been hidden and making it known. It is that esoteric knowledge. It is taking something that is otherworldly up and above our understanding and being able to lower its vibration to the place that it can be understood by the human being. Divine revelation is an awakening and it, it's really much more common uh, than we think. It happens all the time. The spirit of truth is constantly being revealed within us. There is this hidden wisdom that is handed to often thousands at a time. It may be poets and writers simultaneously sharing the same idea. Uh, it could be your hairstylist or your teacher. It is how suddenly there are people disseminated throughout our human experience who are thinking about this same enlightened idea. In the Bible, there's a quote about how spiritual truth is revealed in hidden wisdom to thousands in their hand. Metaphysically, our hand is that doing of things, the ability to take thought, to take spiritual truth and put it into words that can be shared. Think about when we've talked before about um, our Akashic records, right? Our Akashic records will claim that we are from some planet somewhere. I don't actually believe we're from some planet somewhere. I believe that is a way that the information is shared so that our humanness can understand it. To try to explain this realm of consciousness outside our physical body that makes it somehow make sense that we are here and have this connection to the infinite past and infinite future, it is not something our brains can conceive of. And so we find a way to speak it that is worldly, that can be understood on this level of sense perception that we exist in. So basically, <laughs> the book of Revelation is a bunch of books, right? It's a bunch of chapters. There's like 22 of them, and each has a different meaning. And it's interesting to take it apart because a lot of people get scared. They start thinking end of days, right? They hear about things going wrong in the world and people start throwing around the apocalypse and blah, blah, blah. And they get all freaked out. 
This isn't helpful. What is helpful is the metaphysical interpretation. And actually, I guess you could argue that reading it could make it helpful because if you actually read what it says is going on, it does not look at all like what's going on in the world today. It's a, quite a stretch to say that it is. It starts in book one with John. John is communicating the revelation of Jesus Christ. What Jesus realized when he was on the island of Patmos, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Now, Patmos, metaphysically, represents this place in our consciousness where we realize that our carnal self actually does nothing, that it is our spiritual nature within this human experience that creates all things, that it is our thought that ultimately is the power behind all action. Cool, right? <laughs> In chapters two and three, John is basically just addressing all of these different churches, right? Churches just being a collaboration of thought. And he's going into each one of these beliefs and he's explaining to them why they need to let go of some core piece of what their belief system is. And in each one of those, it is some carnal belief in lack could simply put it that way. And so he goes through all of these conversations where he gets to chapter four, where he reveals that there is this heavenly throne. And on that heavenly throne, there is the one surrounded by a rainbow. That rainbow represents the receiving and the transmission of ideas of energy. There are seven colors that work perfectly together, right? They, the crystals, the raindrops, all the things that create that projection of rainbow. It's transcendent. Around this throne where the one sits, the one being you, me, the self, the self aligned to the self, right? Where we sit within our bodies, spirit in body, receiving, projecting all that is reality, meaning the reality of sacred marriage, the self to the self, surrounded there by 24 elders. Elders always represent the coming together of our faculties of spiritual self all of the parts of us that help us see clearly. And as we read through these first four chapters, there's a repeating of specific numbers again and again and again, the number seven, the number 12, it's again, it's again, it's again. Even the 24 elders is 12 times two. 12 is spiritual fulfillment. Seven is fullness, the perfection of man when he is guided or she by spirit, by that conscious connection of the self to the self. It's also interesting to note that with these two chapters that are essentially just him appealing to different churches, it's important to note when this book was written. It was written between 90 and 95 AD. And this was when people were tired of waiting for Jesus to come back. Essentially, a lot, a lot of Christians had been waiting for like 60 years thinking Jesus was going to come back. They needed to be appeased. And I know that this can often be something that um, extremely religious people want to reject, but there is a historical, actual history of government, of kings and queens and popes and things who wrote books for the Bible in order to help people um, stay under control. So it's interesting when we think about the time and wanting to get everybody in line with staying in tuned to this belief that this one leader would come. When in reality, if we start taking again, take this story apart, we learn more and more about our spiritual process that 
as Jesus did at Patmos, we realize in the depths of our consciousness that there's more to this life than the carnal body, that we cannot have the life we wish by only addressing human things, that we must allow ourselves to sit surrounded by that rainbow, by reception, to esoteric knowledge, to spiritual truth, to that giving in. And we must recognize the elders that we have this ability to take all of our spiritual faculties and use them together. In chapter five, it talks about the scroll with seven seals. And it is this weird combination of story between the lion becoming the lamb and in that space is able to receive this scroll and open it. Well, it's interesting because a lion always represents courage, fearlessness, and overcoming. And it's important to notice it's not just any lion. It's the lion of Judah. Judah is our spiritual faculty. It is correlated, is activated by our brain buying into our spiritual reality. Beloved, this is something we talk about in episode after episode. The majority of spiritual practice is for our brain, to get our brain to believe that the spiritual truth is something we can achieve in a concrete world. And so the Lion of Judah is this, having the fearlessness to accept that our spiritual life is accessible. And in that place, we become the Lamb of God, pure life, purity innocence, trusting in the unfolding. And in this place, with this knowledge and awareness, the lamb, the pure and courageous, is allowed to break the seals. As we go through what each one of these seals does and the seven bowls that follow it, remember what seven is, right? Fullness of divine law and perfection. We hear all these words that sound really scary until we take apart what their spiritual representation is. They, basically, the first four seals, or definitely the first four seals, are the release of these four horsemen. Horsemen are representations of elements of self and consciousness, and each of them represents a different piece of us. The pale horse is the physical body, the physical world. Red is the power of our emotions. Black is our intellect with the lack of clarity that comes from that white horse, which is pure thought and spiritual understanding. We must be aware that all of these are required in order for us to live this human life. We must be a balance of caring for the physical self and surroundings, allowing our emotions to come and go like odors in the room, to have the power to direct us, to make us feel, to bring us joy, but never to own us. We must be aware that while our intellect is important, it is flawed when it is not guided by our spiritual awareness and purity. When we move through these four pieces and we claim them all as important and essential, we are then accessible to, we can reach in and take hold of the word of God, the wrath of God. But understand what these things are. The word of God is creative power. You've heard it before. We speak it and it becomes true. You know this. Look into your life. How often have you predicted what happened, good or bad, by your word, what you said, what you thought, where your focus lied. That is what the word of God is. It is the creative power. And the wrath of God, while we often interpret the word wrath to mean something awful, beloved, it is just life school. We become open to the fact that all things are working together in spiritual law, unfolding before us so we can learn and grow and be more. It is not a punishment. It is love. It is a life school. It is why we signed up for a human experience in the first place. 
Yes, it brings earthquakes. It can bring cataclysmic events. Those don't always have to be the end of the world, right? It doesn't have to be something awful. It means recognize I am learning, I am growing, I'm going to take the lesson, I'm going to move on. When we do this, we are visited in chapter 7 by the seven angelic trumpeters. That wave of a harmonious energy that goes through every part of your mind and body. The chills that you get when you realize you figured something out that you needed to know that was important. And in that space, we are filled with faith, with the fullness. Perhaps it will be challenged. That is awakening. The trumpeters, that wave of harmonious energy, brings in the seven bold judgments bowl or cup can be interpreted either way, but this is that vessel of faith. Will it be challenged? Yes, that's what awakening is. That's what life is. Yes, that first bowl when it opens in chapter seven. Is it chapter seven? Yeah. <laughs> Eight. The plagues, they call it. The first one is sores. God, that sounds awful. But what that is, is a crisis of the flesh, a crisis of materiality, realizing that no amount of clothes or things or cars or whatever is going to suffice because the truth is, without spiritual connection, it is meaningless. We are challenged by that early in our awakening. I've told you before, I went years without watching TV or wearing makeup <laughs> because I thought, what is the point? Of course, I was guided to know that we can appreciate human things as long as we have both that spiritual understanding and the human enjoyment of life. The second bowl, the second plague turns the ocean to blood. Sounds awful, right? They say the sea turns to blood and dies. Well, the sea represents our sensate race thought, that unrest, that it's all in our human hands, that we must have control. Let's turn that to blood because blood is life-giving power. Let's kill off that part of ourselves who thinks that all of this is about human accumulation, wealth, materiality, whatever it is. Let's let that go. In the third one, the rivers and springs, the waters, also turn to blood. This is unexpressed potential becoming life-given power. As we awaken, we realize that the more we trust in our spiritual awareness, the more we trust the unfolding, the more we learn and grow, that there is all of this potential, that thing, when you knew there was something more, becomes expressed in that awareness. And the heat wave comes and the fires cleanse and purify. All that was tainted, all the thoughts and fears that belonged to someone else that were taught to us, that were based on ignorance, melt away. And yes, darkness overwhelms the beasts. They can't live anymore. Your fears and insecurities will be overwhelmed in their own darkness. They will dissolve away. They will cease to exist. The thing that fed them, the river that fed your fear and your human attachments will dry up and all will be fed by spirit. And there will be this global earthquake, a shaking that sets you free that knocks off all of the chunks of yuck and ugly and old, that sets you free from this belief that you have to be someone else's idea of you, the old you's idea of you. And you awaken and become something new. This is the revelation, beloved. And if today's pattern of events have anything to do with the revelation. It is not because it is going to bring in some epic turning of events in which the 
craziness happens <laughs> and these people end up being sucked up into the heavens that the seven tribes are taken 12,000 people each or 12 tribes and 12 this and 12 that 12 12 12 spiritual fulfillment when the seals are broken when the lessons are learned when the bowls are filled there is spiritual fulfillment and we raise up and there is this ending to the war between heaven and earth the war between our spiritual truth and our earthly experience that war comes to a head and ends as we awaken and we are allowed in that presence to create a new heaven and a new earth beloved remember that through all of this, we move through chapters 17 all the way to the end, and there are all kinds of crises of self, but Babylon falls. The white horse returns, and Satan, our fear thoughts, our human attachment to bullshit and fear, fades away, and the new heaven and the new earth, this heavenly state fed by the water of life under the tree of life where we are both the lamb and the lion comes to be our new normal. If the events of today prod you to look at yourself, prod you to recognize how loud the voice of truth within you actually is, then yes, this is the revelation. But it's not scary, beloved. It is delightful. Even when the earth quakes, the intention is good. It is a life school. It is awakening. And it is why we're here. Think about it. Roll it around. Leave a comment and let me know what you think. Until next time, beloved. Namaste. My name is Giovanna. And I actually um, discovered Jennifer... At a really difficult time in my life, um, I had made an appointment with a psychiatrist, a counselor, and I had this urge to find someone on a spiritual realm to talk to. And I actually Googled and I found Jennifer and I had had my other two appointments and, you know, they it was what it was. And I finally got to my appointment with Jennifer and after that hour... I felt free and just unlike I had ever in my life. And out of the other two, she helped me completely. And at this point in my life, I'm a completely different person. And um, honestly, thanks to her and her honesty and just her as a person, she's amazing. Um, I would recommend her and I have um, to many people. Um, she's amazing, just simply amazing. Um, I love her. Thank you. Thank you for joining me today for this episode of Lessons from the Universe with Jennifer Hall. It is my privilege to have your ear and your time. Come out, find me on social media, visit one of my seminars, book an educational session. However it is that I can support you, I'm here. Remember, beloved, there's a little brunette with a podcast who's got your back.